Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our third BioVT webinar, uh, which has been co-organized with other Earth Digital Things initiatives. Uh, in the next an hour and a half, we are going to uh, present you uh, the work that BioVT and Destination Earth is going to carry out in the next years, but also uh, we're going to bring other um, uh, outstanding uh, results that other uh, digital twins uh, are going to, to bring. My name is Rita Dufrida. I am a researcher at Plus IT, and I am one of the experts involved in the uh, dissemination and communication activities for BioDT. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all this morning. I will just quickly present to you the agenda uh, so that you can have uh, an overview of all the topics that you will explore in the next an hour and a half. Um, so our first speaker is uh, Christian Kirchstagen from the European Commission Digital Net, and you will hear from him a more strategic overview of why it is important for the European Commission to develop and support uh, the development of digital things of the earth. After this more strategic and political presentation, you can hear uh, more technical details from Jesse Harrison, uh, who is uh, from CSC, and he's also the BioDT project manager, who will instead present the objective scope and expected results of the BioDT project. And you will also hear what are the objective scope and expected results this time of the Destination Earth Initiative from Thomas Gannon, that instead works at ECMWF and is also one of the members of the Destination Earth Initiative. After this, uh, our colleague Jaron uh, Buxagen from TNO will instead focus his presentation on why it is important for BioDT to cooperate to, with um, Destination Earth, but also in general with the Destination, uh, sorry, with the digital twin environments in general. And uh, after this general overview, uh, we can all then uh, try, let's say, and understand how much we all know about um, the digital things um, by testing our knowledge. It will be a more interactive session. It will be a kind of game, and we really hope that you can also learn something more through this. Uh, and then our webinar will end with a panel discussion that is moderated by Yaron. Uh, where our experts will also explain what is the role played by digital twins to support also the European Green Deal and the EU digital strategy. And on top of the uh, experts that you have already met in the first part of our webinar, you will also have the opportunity to meet uh, Yanni uh, Kontanen from CSC, and she's also the project manager of the uh, Climate DT project. And Marina Tonani, then instead will represent the digital project that is instead connected to the the development of uh, the digital twin of the ocean. Uh, here on Zoom, you will you can also ask any questions. Uh, feel free uh, to ask them many time to our speakers in the dedicated Q and A chat. Um, and uh, I see, I mean that uh, we have also quite a lot of people that are joining in the meantime, which is um, very nice for uh, for us. Actually, this morning we are expecting to have more than 180 people that are coming from a very different background. So people from universities, from uh, research infrastructures, industry, but also from the policy environment. And the nice thing is that uh, this webinar has attracted people from more than 20 countries worldwide. Uh, so with this, I would like to welcome you all again to this webinar and really hope that today uh, you can learn something more about why it is important to build her digital twins. And with this, I will pass the floor now to Christian. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Rita, for the introduction. <clears throat> and um, good morning to everyone, first of all. Um, I will let me just try to start my video, but um, box, well. I think I don't know. That doesn't work for the moment. You you will see me hopefully later in the in the discussion session. In a, in any case, you, you you do not lose too much with not seeing my face because I, I have a slight eye infection, so I look somewhat weird. <laughs> um, no, let, let let me go to the um, to the to the presentation. So it's a, it's a presentation. 
On the title, why does the Commission support the development of a digital twin of the Earth? Um, and I hope we can then also have a, a little bit uh, of, a, of, a, of a discussion um, about that. So what I would like to talk about today is uh, this kind of reflection on, on, the, on the reasons why the Commission is sponsoring the, uh, the development of something like a digital twin of the Earth and what that could really mean. And why this should be in public interest. Um, I mean, we we all know, of course, the advantages of digital twins since quite some time. So, for example, digital replica are used since quite some time, actually, in the manufacturing industry to enable more effective design of, of products, and especially now in times of big data and, 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 and supercomputing, with an abundance of data rather easily created and available um, about likely performance outcomes. And all this is relevant, of course, not, not just for a company dealing with, um, with optimization of products, but it's very much also for the public good in view of for example, safety critical applications like I don't know, autonomous driving of cars or 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 testing the performance of technical products under under extreme conditions of industrial processes, under extreme conditions, um, or even for replicating human health. But why should we, as a European institution, spend public money for a digital twin of the Earth? So for for modeling which is something different than modeling a physical system. So for modeling physical earth systems plus socioeconomic systems and converging all that into something like an overall digital earth replica. Um, so the arguments behind this decision um, is what I would like to, to present in this uh, short in this short talk on the so-called Destination Earth Initiative. Now, um, I understand we have a speaker later from, from one of our implementers from ECMWF who will talk in really in technical detail about Destination Earth um, and, and also about its status of development. So just, just a, a very brief introduction now from, from my side on, on what Destination Earth is so that we in the end all have a, a common basic understanding. So Destination Earth aims at developing a highly accurate digital model of the Earth to monitor, simulate and predict natural phenomena and the impact um, of human activity on Earth. And as you can see from, from this collection of buzzwords here on, on this slide, it's a commission-sponsored initiative, uh, well, addressing this famous twin green digital transition challenge, particularly, of course, in view of our efforts to, to take um, and prepare for climate change impacts. Um, and this is also the, let's say, the, the broader policy context in the context of the Green Deal, and not by coincidence, Destination Earth was in, uh, invented in 2019, uh, so just just before the the Green Deal uh, came, or in the in the wake of preparing the the Green Deal. Now, it's um, as you can see from this slide, it's um, it's supposed to work well in the end, like all decision support tools, on the basis of user defined creation of scenarios, in, including the impact sectors, which is at least at this scale something new, and. Um, it, of course, aims to go clearly beyond current levels of, of spatial, but also of temporal resolution and, and, and realism in, in modeling. Also, as there is, of course, a lot already available on, on these topics, it aims to, to leverage, let's say, on the, on the many existing data sources, such as Copernicus, of course, or also the, EU, the EU's um, um, supercomputing infrastructure, high performance computing infrastructure, and scale up existing models, and fuse, of course, simulation with observation, which is ultimately the, let's say, the kind of basic definition of what constitutes a, a digital twin. Um, the next slide, please. Um, so this, um, let's say this, um, very high precision digital model of the earth should then enable users to understand better the well the many challenges of of, of the earth system for example the ones coming from climate change um and related impacts on on human activities and on the basis of this should then support trusted 
and this is a keyword, trusted evidence-based decision-making. Um, now, since, again, the speaker from ECNWF will talk about it in more detail, but just very briefly, since December 21 um, and until mid of 2024, Destination Earth is in its first phase of development. Um, um, development which um, well which is performed on behalf of the commission by three implementing entities the european space agency umetsat and ecmwf and this is important to to add and with a really great number of horizon europe projects supporting this development directly or, or indirectly um so the objective is to have by 2024 some first services running, particularly concrete use cases in relation to the first two, two digital twins. The first one on climate change adaptation, the other one on environmental extremes. And then in, in, in subsequent phases, the models and the data, which are already included in this open platform, uh, will continuously be improved and, and extended, possibly extended to other th thematic areas. Now, and then as, as said in the in the beginning, by the end of the decade, a so-called full digital twin of the earth should be ready. Um, and I suppose the speaker from ECMWF will, will later tell you a lot of um, how far the, these three entities are with this development, how well they integrate the Europe, uh, European science and technology landscape, and, and of course also about the involvement of real end users, particularly policy end users. Now, the, the last slide, um, which is actually the the real slide, so to say, of, of my of my short talk. Again, the basic question: Why is the Commission funding such an initiative? Now, you you could say all this is nothing really new. I mean the let's say the idea or the, the, the dream of a perfect map uh, goes back a, a very long time actually, and well before the digital age. But with the digital age, this vision of a perfect replica of the earth moved to becoming something practical and, or let's say a practical and manageable, particularly manageable reality. And you might have heard about this announcement of Vice Pre uh, US Vice President Al Gore, who announced in, in 1998, I think, a vision uh, on a kind of 3D virtual globe, uh, which is accessible by everybody, which you could say then developed into Google Earth. And it didn't did not only develop into Google Earth, but it also developed in, into many international in each initiatives on this type of issue with a lot of active engagement already at that time from the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. A lot is going on um, now. Um, let's say, for example, outside of Europe, this vision is um, translated currently into reality by I don't know, for example, NASA and, and of course, by, by, by tech giants in the US, such as Google or, or Microsoft or NVIDIA. What is striking here is that the real drive behind the, the mentioned US examples seems to come mainly from the technology sector. Now, again, the question, why, why destination Earth and why such an initiative for Europe and what is the, the added value for, for Europe? Um, I think the added value... Um, is uh, along the three goals mentioned on, on this slide. So the first one provides support to evidence-based policy development and implementation for high-stake issues, classical high-stake issues of, of course, climate change. Um, and for this, it's necessary to achieve all these uh, high resolutions as, as, as shown here. And um, immediate application areas are, of course, then disaster risk management, climate change adaptation, all kind of environmental pollution and then environmental management and restoration possibly, uh, both for the use by EU and by member states policy services. Um, so for to achieve this um, destination Earth is expected well to go beyond the let's say the current highly complex science models which are mainly designed for the use by other scientists. So it should, Destination Earth should really enable an informed usage for a large variety of 
concrete end users from policy, from science, from the, but also from the general public. Um, and for that, we expect that um, Destination Earth then develops new and much more intuitive forms also of, of interaction between such type of science tools, expert systems, let's call them, and non-specialists, including policy people and, and the general public. So this is the first goal and which which is which is worth the investment. The second one is to develop an open infrastructure to test and benchmark models and data. So destination earth should be open, open for the mentioned non-specialist users, but open of, of course also for scientists to test, for example, and benchmark their tools and data. So in the end, uh, Destination Earth would therefore develop into something like, yeah, like a kind of virtual center of excellence on, on modeling of key societal challenges, for example, climate change or climate change adaptation. Um, and the added value under this goal would be to to demonstrate the capability to act as an open infrastructure, integrating best available knowledge and strengthening existing capabilities via digital twin technology, via the European Union's supercomputing infrastructure and, and so on. Um, a third goal is then to really bro broaden the scope and reach out and bringing technology and 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 science together and in that sense develop a, a new interdisciplinary research agenda which includes for example also social science which is, seems to be pretty often neglected or almost forgotten in, in decision support tools again to support concrete end users now what what that means is that well in the end destination earth would provide the kind of integrating link between latest research activities in the field, for example, climate change modeling, and their continuous deployment in an operational system. Um, so resulting in a, in the end also in the continuous evolution of the tools, for example, the twins and their use cases, which are already implemented in, in Destination Earth. So in summary, um, Destination Earth is, is definitely not for the sake of promoting technology. And it's also not just another EU funded research project, but um, what the commission expects from Destination Earth is the, is the emergence, let's say the gradual emergence of an operational system or an operational infrastructure continuously taking up um, best available science for a wide range of concrete end users. And it's certainly not about building, as happened in the past, building new huge digital castles that are essentially remaining largely uninhabited. So, but, but really about providing concrete support to policy end users, also to scientists, but in the first wave to policy end users. Um, and also for, of course, for for, uh, for further promoting and integrating best available European science, and therefore we, we have this close link to Horizon Europe and to our to our colleagues from from the research uh, services. Yeah, this is all what I what I wanted to to say. Thanks a lot for the for the attention, and I'm I'm happy to respond later on, uh, I suppose, to some questions which you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Uh, I see that uh, actually some speakers uh, uh, are also going to, uh, to ask a question. Uh, if you want, you can also uh, provide a um, brief overview about the, the one that uh, one of our attendees has asked. Uh, I can read it out loud and you can also reply. And then obviously, as Christian will also join us during the panel discussion, in case you will have any other questions, you can also address them uh, in the second part of our webinar. Um, this one in particular is related to the Green Deal data space uh, because um, the attendees would like to know how will uh, Destination Hearn harness the future um, European Green Deal data space and what is the vision for um, connecting and let's say uh, interacting uh, between these initiatives. 
I think this this is a this is a perfect question for the for the panel. Uh, and the the, the main reason, uh, well, not the main reason, but uh, one reason is uh, because I think we we should first uh, listen to the to the presentation from from ECNWF, uh, which will also talk about I suppose uh, about uh, the the data lake and the well the, the data strategy in the end also of of destination Earth. But I'm I'm then very happy to to take up the the question, of course. Perfect. Thank you, Christian. Uh, now, instead, our next speaker uh, is um, uh, Yasse Harrison from the BioDP project. Uh, Yasse, I suppose that you can also share your screen now. Sounds good. Perfect. So Thank you. One second. So here we go. Should be visible to you now. Uh, I can start with introducing myself. So. Well, of course, welcome to this seminar. My name is um, Jesse Harrison. I work as a senior data scientist at uh, CSC IT Center for Science in, in Finland. And uh, I am the project manager for the Biodiversity Digital Twin. And during the next uh, minutes, I will be uh, giving you a general overview of what the Biodiversity Digital Twin project is about. So uh, discussing especially the project project objectives and scope, and also some of the results that we uh, aim to achieve. But I really want to, to start with um, talking a little bit about the different project partners involved in here. So uh, CSC coordinates the project, but we have a total of 22 different organizations involved in this project. So we benefit a lot from uh, expert input from different uh, project partners, including universities and also uh, biodiversity research research infrastructures in the projects. So this is a Horizon Europe funded project. And in addition to European partners, we'll also have partners from the UK and involved in the project. And a little bit of background information. So uh, BioDT, Bio well, the whole, whole project title is Biodiversity Digital Twin. Uh, for advanced modeling, simulation, and prediction capabilities. And the project started uh, last year, so it started in June 2022. <clears throat> it's a three-year project, so it runs until end of May 2025. And for this project, we have a funding of around 11 million euros. And if we're thinking just about very high-level goals of the project, well, the idea is, is that uh, we will extend this um, <clears throat> digital twin concept and thinking to the realm of uh, biodiversity research. And special goals that we have are to, to develop ways to better observe changes in biodiversity uh, across space and also across time. And uh, we also want to develop ways in which to, to understand why these changes are occurring, so uh, also improving our, our mechanistic understanding of, of biodiversity shifts in response to environmental change. And as part of this work, we are looking to push the limits of a predictive biodiversity modeling. What this means is that we want to combine uh, different existing biodiversity modeling methods that haven't really been used together before for example, to develop new kinds of understanding. And the BioDDT project also aims to, to provide uh, infrastructure to, to help uh, meet the uh, objectives of long-term biodiversity research, help maintain commitments to, to protecting biodiversity and also the resilience of, of human societies in the face of uh, environmental change. So these are some of the very high level goals of the BioDT project. And before I go into the uh, more detailed objectives and expected results, I also want to highlight some of the many <clears throat> policies that the project connects with. So there is the uh, EU biodiversity strategy, which has, has a lot of different components, of course, but one is, uh, for example, reversing the uh, decline of pollinators, and also, toward the end of, of last year, uh, this uh, new 
global biodiversity framework, so the coming uh, Montreal framework was installed. And this is a very ambitious package of different measures for addressing biodiversity loss and uh, ensuring that uh, different land and also uh, marine areas are protected. There are also United Nations Sustainable Development Goals that the work aligns with, so goals such as zero hunger, uh, good wealth and well-being, and also life on land. So this uh, project focuses primarily on modeling biodiversity on land. There's also the European Green Deal. So uh, developing a better understanding of, of biodiversity is also part of developing uh, better resilience to, to climate change. And there's also the European strategy for data. So uh, this EU level of ambition of establishing a single market uh, for data. So these are some of the policies. And if I go to the uh, specific goals and objectives of the projects, well, we are dealing with something quite new in this project. So biodiversity digital twins don't really exist. So we want to build and deploy uh, a prototype platform for, for working with this. And first and foremost, we are working on uh, establishing this on the Lumi a uh, supercomputer which is hosted by CSC, but we are also developing this in a way that is compatible with, with other supercomputing systems. So the idea is that uh, it would be something that can be used on multiple uh, supercomputing platforms. We have a whole range of different uh, prototype digital twins that we want to develop as part of the project. So we have these grouped under different use case groups so if I go, these, go through these very quickly, there's a species response to environmental change. Uh, we also have a use case group on genetically detected biodiversity. And then uh, dynamics and threats from and for species of uh, policy concerns. So these include invasive and endangered species. And then also modeling of, of disease outbreaks and, and pollinator survival. So this fits under this. Uh, category of species interactions with each other and with humans. And we don't want to just develop models. We also want to validate them to, to test them quite thoroughly to see how well we are able to actually make the digital twins work. And if we condense this to, to specific goals, well, we want to ensure that this prototype platform is available for use mentioned several case studies. Uh, the models uh, are also, or we have the goal of, of improving the predictive performance of the models that we are using and also the accuracy and precision. And as mentioned a little bit earlier, we have uh, different biodiversity research infrastructures involved in the project. So we want to integrate with them and the uh, research infrastructures involved in the projects are, are GBIF, LifeWatch ERIC, and ELTER, and also DISCO. And this integration is then established using different interfaces, uh, ways to, to ensure that people have common ways of authentication and, and access. And of course, since we have a number of different organizations and, uh, and so forth involved, we want to make sure that the uh, ways we work with data, software, and so forth are, are uh, as interoperable as possible. There's also the goal of, of reaching new user communities. So we have uh, a specific goal of, of increasing user uptake and, and training in the project as well. So we have uh, standard APIs to, to enable uh, the feeding of data to uh, the BioDT platform and also from the uh, platform. And we have a work package on fair compliance, so findable, accessible, interoperable, so for uh, data. And the idea is that we would have standards then that, that can be applied across the different research infrastructures involved. And what FDO stands for, it's a fair digital object. So this will be a, a common way of organizing data and 
associated metadata to uh, help make data as easy to access as possible and uh, as easy to share as possible. There's also goals in terms of establishing ways to assess the quality of data, so the fairness of the data. And as part of the training activities, we have a number of different workshops arranged. And Destiny, well, it will feature quite heavily in this webinar, so I won't cover too much of it, but uh, one of the objectives is to, to make sure that what we are doing is, is uh, compatible with Destiny and also many of the other European Digital Twin projects that are uh, now in progress. So we have uh, objectives of uh, having showcases of, of synchronization between different digital twins and also integrating with some of these wider services for, for making data and software and different practices uh, accessible. So the European Open Science Cloud and Alexa and also the EU data spaces for, for establishing harmonized ways to, to manage data. And the general idea here is that we are, uh, through this work, able to contribute more to the ability of the EU to adapt its actions and policies for uh, biodiversity in, in particular. So we want to be able to ingest data that are generated through destination Earth. And we also want to be able to, to generate data sets that can be used by other projects that are uh, under this uh, Destination Earth umbrella. And as part of this work, also we aim to, to establish a catalog of different services that can be then made available to different users, including uh, users of the European Open Science Club. And uh, leveraging also these uh, existing tools that are offered, for example, through Alexa. And briefly, just about the target groups of the project. So uh, biodiversity research infrastructures, of course, and data providers and researchers. So this is more the science or scientist angle, but we are also approaching policymakers, industry, and uh, citizen scientists. So we also have a use case where we are working with, with citizen science in particular. And uh, that brings me to my last slide. So uh, that's all for me. Thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you. Yes. Uh, as we really said before, uh, later on, all our speakers will also join a panel discussion. So if you have any questions related to BioDT, yes, uh, we'll be more than happy to reply. Uh, during uh, our panel session uh, will start at, an, at 11 a.m. Uh, now, after this presentation, we will move uh, towards the Destination Earth objectives that are presented by Thomas Gannon from ECMWF. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, the, the, all the floor is yours. Thanks, Lida. I think you blocked my video at some point in time. Yes, uh, we, we can see your slides. Yeah, but, uh, okay, it's fine. You, uh, I cannot start my. Uh, oh, there it is. All right, perfect. Okay, Thanks. Perfect. I didn't, <laughs> Good. I didn't perfect the button there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so yes, I would like to, to share a, a few to say a few words about uh, destination Earth and uh, and also how it how it links to uh, to BioDT and how it links to uh, to the wider uh, digital twin ecosystem. So let me go to the next slide. So since this this talk is also very much about the digital things themselves, um, I would like to, to emphasize a little bit the role of ECWF in, in Destination Earth. So as Christian already mentioned, Destination Earth is executed by uh, by three entrusted entities, ESA, uh, Humansat, and ECWF. ESA is responsible for the, for the user-facing part of Destination Earth, the, the, the service platform where you just log in and interact with, the, with Destination Earth. And um, Humansat is responsible for the data lake and uh, the federation of, of, of data sources that are that are needed um, to, to run digital twins in the in the context of destination earth. Um, and Eastern WF is responsible for the actual implementation of uh, three digital twins, sort of two, but the one is sort of split in two parts, uh, and also to provide the digital twin engine that allows um, 
interaction with the digital twins and also interaction with the with the data. Um, so yeah, the digital twins that, that we are that we are implementing in in the first phase of destination Earth are are one on uh, extreme events, uh, which consists of two parts. One is like a, sort of a continuous um, digital twins. It's more like a background model that that continuously runs and detects if extreme events are imminent. And then there's an on-demand digital twin that will then be triggered by such an uh, such an imminent event, and then run uh, specific, more focused uh, uh, models for a specific region where that event will, will take place. And we also are uh, developing a uh, climate digital twin that is mainly focused on uh, climate change adaptation uh, scenarios. So if we uh, if we zoom in, in in a little bit on, on destination Earth and in particular on the on the digital twins themselves, so obviously uh, we are we are focusing um, uh, on, on on three main pillars. Firstly, on improving the the simulation and provide more realistic models. Um, but that's obviously not all. The the second really important component is on uh, developing the capability to combine. Uh, observe and simulate information from the entire Earth system. So, as I mentioned earlier, you need obviously a model uh, that, that, that captures the, the basic physics. Uh, but then, on top of that, you need uh, specific applications and, and digital twins that capture um, specific uh, um, impact sectors. So, for instance, food, water, energy, and health, and they will they will run on on top of or or together with or combined with other digital twins, and that together creates this. A digital twin ecosystems where all the digital twins uh, can interact with each other and in the end uh, answer the answer the questions that uh, that you would like to have the end, your answers to. And the third really important thing is uh, interactivity and configurability of these digital twins and access to all the data that is being produced by the digital twins, but also the models and the workflows. So you will not only be uh, able to interact with the data itself, but also with the models and the, and the workflows. So a few words about this uh, this extreme digital twin. So as I mentioned before, there's a background um, weather model running that picks up on extreme events, and then um, uh, extreme if uh, the digital twins will be will be triggered. Um, the development of the digital twins is being led by a consortium. Uh, it's being done by a consortium led by Meteo Meteo France. And they will focus on uh, providing capabilities to uh, to zoom in on a certain specific region and then go to quite extreme uh, resolutions and uh, and uh, and execute uh, execute them. Obviously, these digital twins themselves also come with their own specific set of use cases. So for the extreme, we are focusing on uh, hydrology, extreme flood events on air quality, but we're also going to look at the renewable energy sector to understand the impact of, uh, of storms and extreme events, but also on maybe shifting um, uh, solar radiation patterns. For the climate, um, we see something something similar. So obviously, we, we're going to, to higher resolution and uh, higher fidelity of these, of these uh, simulations. Um, this particular activity is executed by by CS by CSC led uh, consortium, um, and they are going to focus on uh, the multi decadal global and storm and any resolving numerical earth system simulations that will allow to uh, to predict uh, um, climate change with uh, with, uh, with much more um, with much higher level of detail. Also makes it easier for uh, for for use cases to connect to it since the information about the climate change will be presented at a resolution that matches better the uh, the typical uh, regional uh, DT, like for instance uh, biodiversity uh, digital twin. Also, the climate digital twin comes with its own set of uh, set of use cases. So in this case, uh, there's use cases on on, on fires on on fresh water. Also on extreme events, also the impact of climate change on the energy sector, and also uh, on on urban heat. So digital twins for for cities. All right, I'm going a little bit into the technical part. Uh, looking at the time, <laughs> I have to speed up a little bit. So here you you see the, the technical landscape. 
On the left hand side, you see the digital twins and where they run. They're all running on your HPC systems. Uh, close to that, we will have uh, the data bridge, or the, uh, which is part of the data lake, which is the, uh, the distributed part of the data lake that sits very, very close to where the data is being produced next to the Euro HPC systems. There is also a central uh, data lake component, which is more like a federation of existing uh, data, uh, data holdings and research infrastructures. So one of the things, for instance, that we're looking uh, at with, with, with BioDT is if you can federate their uh, research infrastructures into this data lake so that that data can be consumed in Destination Earth and um, BioDT cases can run inside Destination Earth and using that data. And you have the, the, the core service uh, platform uh, that is the interface to the user and where also particular uh, user face or appli facing applications will be will be run and also the visualization will be uh, will be made available. Uh, all right. So here uh, again, we quickly show this slide. But the thing that is uh, that is relevant for um, for for the interfaces and the interoperability with other uh, digital twins is this third point that I mentioned before about um, access to all data models and and workflows. So what we're building uh, there at the moment is a digital twin engine that will provide this capability to integrate these different components. Um, it's a framework for Earth system models. It's a collection of APIs and services that you could compare somewhat like a, like a, like a gaming engine, but then for, for Earth systems. And it comes with a lot of components that you can use to build, develop, and operate your, your digital twins and allow you to interact with other digital twins as well. Obviously, these components are opt-in. So if you want to use your own components, obviously you're free to use your own components, but then you have to think about uh, interfacing them directly. Well, if you pick up the components that we provide, the integration is uh, already done for you. Um, we understand that these components are continuously evolving, also uh, evolving with the uh, currently evolving standards. Um, on, for instance, also software quality, data access, and data management, and there we want we want to comply with those with those standards when uh, exposing those interfaces. Uh, very very quickly, this is another view on the landscape. So you have the Euro HPC on the left, where the digital twins are running and operating. On the in the middle part, you have the data bridges where the data will be exposed, and on the right hand side, you have the user facing uh, platform. Obviously, this is a very important component of Destination Earth um, to uh, facilitate the different uh, user communities. We do foresee that uh, during the life cycle of the different models, uh, these models will uh, move across the different components in the landscape. And what it means is that we all have to provide interfaces on all these different levels to, to data and, uh, and the different uh, uh, workflow components and, and digital twin interfaces. What we expect to find there is that not every digital twin has to be integrated in, uh, in, the, same, uh, in the same way. So we expect we have sort of an integration continuum where you have fully integrated digital twins that are themselves also our system models, like for instance, uh, ocean digital twins or, uh, or uh, 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 digital twins for, of uh, volcanoes where, where uh, volcanic ash will have to be coupled to atmospheric transport and so on. We will, we will expect a coupling model where there will be sort of a loose, loose, more loose coupling between the digital twins. And we expect uh, on the right hand side of the spectrum, a, a very loose coupling between digital twins where maybe only maybe some, some specific information uh, will, be, will, be, will be consumed. Um, so here's a quick example of what, what it means, what kind of integration um, you would expect then. So actually really on the models, with, for the, on the model level themselves, or with the different digital twin engine components, and then it becomes step by step. The, the integration becomes more loosely coupled, uh, and then at some point you will see that maybe you don't even are aware that you're using uh, destination or digital twin engine components, which is con consuming some uh, some end product. This is an interesting case where we see a very tight integration uh, for the climate digital twin, where actually run, models are run side by side on the HPC system and directly tapping into the data while it is being streamed off the digital twin while it is running in production. Uh, we, we're implementing these cases as well, so you can see we have integration on 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 a very uh, uh, on, on on many different levels. Here again, you quickly see the landscape with the different interaction components. And just a side note here that at the moment we're still understanding um, how the funding model will be for these integration activities, and also um, destination Earth will provide a lot of components, but it will not provide uh, HPC resources. So we expect that if, if uh, initiatives want to run with Destination Earth, they will bring their own uh, computational um, resources. And that was what I wanted to say about Destination. 
Thanks a lot, Thomas, uh, for this uh, very clear overview. Uh, and now instead, our next speaker is Yaron from Kino, who will instead will showcase why it is important for all these initiatives to, to work together. Uh, over to you, Yaron. All right. Great to be the next speaker. I hope everyone can see my screen and hear me. Uh, my name is Jeroen Boekhuizen. I work at TNO, which is a Dutch research institute. I'm there, the lead expert on digital twins. And uh, with that, I want to say uh, I'm very broadly oriented. So I have a background also in manufacturing, where digital twins has been a common practice uh, for some longer time. But also in urban planning and uh, earthquakes, for example, have also been involved. Um, so for me, the interesting part is how do we how do we make these twins work, and that's why I also wanted to talk about the collaboration and how can how we can work together from a multiple digital twin perspective. That's what I wanted to share today. Yeah, so um, let's rehash the goal for BioBT very briefly. Uh, so it's supporting the research infrastructures with the prototype digital twin, and that should drive both science and use cases and connect to other EU twins. And for me, this distinction between science and use cases is an important one, because from manufacturing perspective, usually a twin is used in an engineering type of work, where we humans do something in the world and we want to um, uh, impacts our environment. Well, as researchers and scientists want to understand what's going on and capture. So to frame this in the game engine from uh, Thomas Geiner from just now, can we define the rules of the game engine in such a way that we have a good understanding of high fidelity and quality uh, so that users can then use the um, uh, game engine to make games or uh, create something that's based on real facts and the real world and how it really works. So that's what we are trying to capture in also in biodiversity. So can we measure what's going on in nature? Can we capture that? Can we allow scientists to better understand species, climate, environment, cross species, pollinators, etc.? And can policymakers or industry then use those models to create impact in our environment. And I think these are linked to very, very big questions that are very tough. Um, for example, how will climate change affect biodiversity? And what can we humans do to mitigate that loss of biodiversity? Or should we maybe adapt to the new status quo and will we then still be able to produce enough food and be self-sufficient? Can we stay healthy with all kinds of new diseases coming in? And I think from a more societal perspective, do we want to make biodiversity and financial interests comparable, yes or no? These are all big questions, maybe I think too big even for BioDT to solve, but that's what we're trying to strive towards. And I think that's also what the EU is striving towards. If I look at the Destination Earth program, where the initial twins, just as Thomas was saying, is the climate change and extreme weather, but we are, are already working in current uh, EU projects like biodiversity, digital twin, but also digital twin for the ocean or a digital twin for geo, intertwin, Iliads, there's a ditto program, all creating prototype twins um, as a, let's say, the first set of twins uh, that are going to be linked to the Destination Earth program. And already the calls are out there to develop the next set of digital twins for biosphere, marine life, hydrology, ocean, cryosphere, atmosphere, land surface, etc. But also I've already seen the calls for localized city twins or the EU power grid. And so there will be many, many more different applications and twins building on top of this infrastructure. And how do we then do that? And Thomas already said these three integration patterns. So can we directly integrate the twin into the destination earth system? 
or is it going to be a tightly coupled twin where somehow workflows are going to be integrated and interface with the destination Earth digital twins? Or will it be more loosely coupled as a post-processing application? And if I look at these twins that are listed here on the right, they are all currently loosely coupled as post-processing applications. So they are not themselves running on the destination Earth system, but they will reuse the results coming from the destination Earth system. So the question then is, how do we transition from this loosely coupled situation to either an embedded twin or a more tightly coupled twin? Uh, when can that take place? And under which circumstances um, do we make this shift happen? I don't know yet. I don't have the answers. I think that's something that we want to discover. And especially given the end users that are hopefully going to use these twins, because making the twin for the twin itself, just for science is good, but also we want to somehow translate that science into practical use. And that means that we have different user groups. And in BioDT, we've identified four. I'm nowhere near going to say that this is complete, but just as an outline for different uh, types of users, because they have different expectations. So as I said, scientists and research infrastructures, they want to have better understanding of nature, higher quality models, increased data coverage, more species covered, increased collaboration in science, and also the widening the field of biodiversity itself as goals. Policymakers want to have achievable policies, hopefully clear biodiversity metrics, mitigation strategies, and somehow um, be able to make decisions on either social or economic or biodiversity aspects and do scenario planning. Industry, on the other hand, they want to be compliant to the policies that have been made. So can they, by default, um, be compliant and minimize their impact or design for diversity and have maybe a changing role in the ecosystem, maybe even provide biodiversity services? And if we look at civil society and citizen scientists, um, what I've heard so far is that they're called the nature enthusiasts. They want to engage with nature. Maybe they can help increase data coverage, take samples, or stimulate the local biodiversity and activate mitigation strategies on a local level. All kinds of different uses for the results that our twins generate. But we won't get there easily. If I look at the future developments for these four groups, um, I'm seeing a lot of research infrastructures creating virtual environments for science, where you can set up your personal data space, your experiment environment and validation environments, where you use low code or less code, um, where it's by default able to scale up to HPC and cloud facilities, where you can get fast results and do quick experimentation and also speed up the science itself. And if you then have results, can you then easily transition these results into another, let's say more infrastructure type of work, for example, uh, embedded into destination earth. If we look at the policymakers, I'm seeing all kinds of tools being made where you have an interactive environment where you can evaluate future scenarios, establish your weights for social, economic, or for example, biodiversity or other parameters based on proven accurate models. And in that way, drive the sustainable development goals. If I look at what's happening in industry, there usually it's all about yield or profit. But I see a shift there in terms of either EU law coming up or the basic perception of industry itself in becoming more sustainable, that it's not just enough to have the best yield, but doing that in a way that also supports nature in a way that um, you keep the yield at the same level while keeping biodiversity intact. And in that way, you are becoming de facto compliant 
if you're acquiring new permits or having new developments, and maybe even deliver tools that offer mitigation services or adaptation services for the climate change. And for citizens, create understanding of the policy that's been affected and how that affects their surroundings, and hopefully also activate and engage with nature itself. But I see only the first aspect of all these developments. There's still required a lot of work for this to work because highly accurate uh, models and twins aren't there yet, they're in creation. So I think to achieve these possible futures that I just highlighted, um, all these twins need to collaborate, create a common language, way of speaking, way of working, a common set of goals, a common set of types of twins and uses for twins. We need to have common interoperability um, methodologies to either um, specify data formats, but also the way these twins work and how you can make them interact with each other and define interfaces. And by doing that, then we can create a leap in science in scale and understanding of our environment. Um, but also it will require common data, a common way of having this virtual environment, common code books, and common ways to do validation. And in that, by having all this in a common way, we can make twins simpler to make and simpler to use. And hopefully then have the right set of uh, data available to make the global scale possible. And very likely I'm still missing a couple of dots here, which I think is fine um, because we're just at the start of this twin transition. Um, so that's all I wanted to say and I, I'm, Looking forward to the discussion later on. Thank you, Yaron. Um, in a couple of minutes, uh, there will be also the opportunity for you to uh, hear more about all these topics uh, in the panel discussion. But before doing so, we would like uh, just to do a very quick quiz uh, with all of you. Uh, I have just shared in the chat a tool, uh, a link um, that you can just uh, click and then you should be redirected to a page uh, that I'm also sharing right now. Okay, I, I see that you are all already connected. Uh, this tool is called Mintimeter, it is pretty use uh, to you. So the only thing that you have to do is to uh, click on the link that I have shared. If you have issues, you can also uh, go uh, and access menti.com and use the code that you can see here on the top of the slides. Uh, so I see that you are starting to uh, be familiar with this tool, and I also, uh, and I'm also pleased to see that we have a lot of people that are coming from a lot of different countries, mainly European, but uh, quite a lot. And um, so now I will move uh, to the next question um, that uh, is related to the destination herd. So uh, we would like to know if you have ever heard about the destination herd initiative. And okay. It seems that the majority of people that have attended today at least heard something about this initiative and maybe others were curious. And we really hope that today was really an opportunity for you to understand a little bit better from both strategic and technical point of view what this initiative is about. Uh, now it will be uh, another, bit, let's say, a little bit more technical question. And uh, we are asking you to rank uh, different topics. Uh, so these are the topics that are uh, developed ma mainly by the BioDT use cases. You can also find more information about the use cases that we are developing on our website. Uh, you can just uh, visit BioDT.eu and uh, um, find more information about each of them. Uh, so from uh, your point of view, what are the most relevant topics for your research? This will also help us understand uh, uh, where the, the majority of your researchers are also uh, putting their focus on. And it seems that the biodiversity dynamics and the ecosystem services are uh, the most, uh, let's say, <laughs> uh, the, um, the, the, the ones that are um, most studied, let's say. And after that, we have uh, endangered and invasive species. 
Okay, good, thank you. And now I will ask you my last question and then I will leave the floor to our panelists. Uh, this one is uh, somehow related to the sustainable development goals, which have been also cited by some of our speakers before, like uh, Yaron. And um, uh, here we have, uh, let's say, put together different sustainable development goals, and we would like to hear from you uh, what, let's say, um, which sustainable development goals uh, benefit the most from the development of the digital herd twins. Um, in this case, you can see let's say uh put numbers and uh, grade them okay so i see that uh according to some people the uh, most impactful one are the climate action and life on land uh, followed by affordable and clean ocean and also uh yeah life below water okay it, it seems that somehow all the uh, sdg has uh can benefit actually from this uh, obviously, some more, a little bit less, but overall, uh, all this work will also have a huge impact also from an environmental, a political and social point of view. And uh, with this question, I would like to thank you for taking part in this very short quiz. And now I will leave the floor back to all our speakers and uh, Yaron, who will moderate the panel discussion. Thank you. All right, uh, welcome to the panel discussion, everyone. I believe we have two uh, speakers who haven't introduced themselves yet. Um, uh, that's Marina Tonani. I think maybe you should go first and introduce yourself and then um, Jenny Kontkan. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. I'm Marina Tonani from Mercator Ocean. I'm an oceanographer and uh, I'm the project manager of the European uh, Digital Twin of the Ocean uh, project for building the infrastructure. My background is in physical oceanography and in particular in uh, operational uh, modeling. So I'm also involved in the ideas that are uh, behind the modeling components that uh, have been mentioned here by my colleagues for uh, Destination Earth and that will uh, it will be one of uh, the um, important component of the digital twin. All right, Jenny. Thank you. So hello, everyone. I'm Jenny Kontkanen. I'm a development manager and leader of a digital twin technologies group at CSC, IT Center for Science. I'm also service manager for, for the Climate Digital Twin project, which we have already heard about, and uh, CSC uh, coordinates this project. So thank you. All right, um, we've seen uh, several questions from uh, the chat and the Q&A. Um, I'm going to tackle a couple of them and see um, uh, if anyone wants to speak up, just uh, uh, unmute yourself and uh, start talking. Um, so one of the questions uh, we got is that there is uh, a lot of work being done on Destination Earth, on Biodity, on the Ocean Twin, um, but the timelines uh, are still a bit fluid at the moment. Uh, maybe uh, from Thomas, Marina and Jesse, you can say something or each of you can say something about the timing of your projects and when you think you can engage in this collaboration. Yeah, from Destination Earth, I think we are already engaging in a collaboration. Uh, obviously, we're working quite closely with BioDT and also with InterTwin, but also DTG and Digital Twin Ocean. Uh, we have regular uh, exchanges with, and we, we even started the workshop session led by DG Connect. Uh, we had our first se session on the, on the 16th of last, last month in Brussels. Uh, where all the digital twin initiatives came together and we discussed how we can make them interoperable. We will have a follow-up discussion on the on the 25th of uh, of May already. So we have quite a good um, a good uh, frequency there of, of meetings. So that that looks that looks very interesting. So for in for destination urban, we are currently in phase one. We'll be uh, phase one will end um, in the summer of next year. By the time we expect to have um, Things more or less up and running in sort of a pre-production phase. So currently we are developing the different digital twins. 
Um, we are also uh, developing the infrastructure. So we're deploying, for instance, the data bridge and the data lake. And the procurement for the uh, core service platform by ESA is currently also underway. So we expect to be these, all these components to be um, uh, to be available and operational uh, by uh, the end of phase one. Right, Marina. Yes, so from the um, uh, digital twin of the ocean point of view, it's uh, a project. So the difference between uh, Destination Earth and the DTO is that the DTO is uh, a uh, research project. It just started a uh, few months ago. So it started uh, towards the end of 2022. And uh, the phase for building the infrastructure will uh, uh, finish in 2024, while the phase for building the modeling capacity will end in 2025. So this is our uh, time frame. It's, uh, everything is very short. <laughs> and uh, uh, we are uh, in the phase where we are uh, uh, starting to uh, develop our infrastructure. And for us, it's of paramount importance to be connected with uh, all the initiatives like uh, uh, BioDT, for understanding their needs and understanding how we can be interoperable also with these communities that maybe doesn't have such a direct link with the ocean, with other like other communities that we are used to work with, but it's really uh, very important to understand and uh, uh, to be involved so that we can uh, work together because at the end the biosphere is one <laughs> and everything <laughs> is connected. Right. Um, Yeni, maybe you can say something about the climate DT because uh, that's under the umbrella of Destination Earth. I think one of the first uh, digital twins to be implemented there. Maybe you can say something on how this works and uh, what you're currently developing. Yeah, sure. So like Thomas already mentioned, uh, the first version of the climate digital twin will be developed by uh, uh, next year's sp spring. So our project started uh, last year, September, and will end in or the first for now this first phase of the project will end in April uh, 24. And uh, now uh, by that time, we will uh, deliver a version of the climate digital twin that will perform a global climate simulations at a five kilometer resolution uh, over multiple decades. And we will also have integrated in this climate digital twin uh, system uh, these uh, five different uh, applications uh, that Thomas was already introducing in his uh, presentation. So the goal is that by the end of this phase one, we can really demonstrate this uh, how this climate digital twin uh, can work and bring added value. And then in the uh, future phases, we can then improve this further and do even higher resolution simulations and so on. All right. Uh, yes, sir, you already spoke, of course, about the BioDT. Yes, I can still comment on the project internal timelines a little bit further. So. Uh, so yes, this is a project and we have a, a two year timeline still left, but um, work is progressing very fast this year and we have, uh, let's say, internal goals of establishing connections with other uh, digital twins later this year and we also want to have our first um, prototype up and running around um, autumn or so. And we are also already involved in uh, these discussions with uh, DG Connect about uh, technology transfer and then uh, also independently with, with different uh, DT projects. Okay, um, I see a question uh, coming up and I think that's in line with um, uh, 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 this sense. Um, We've talked about the end users who are going to use these twins. Um, some might be non-scientists, but uh, like policymakers or industry or the, the uh, general population. Um, but so far, all the let's say modeling is very scientific. Uh, so how do we bridge that gap? um have uh, coming from uh, that direction i see marina yeah, uh, smiling uh, i i guess this is something known as a oceanographer um just curious what are your thoughts yes i think this is a very big challenge 
for all the digital twin community because uh, as a so I'm talking as scientist. As scientists, we are used to communicate with our community. And when you uh, try to achieve to communicate to the citizen, is really a big challenge in terms of how we do organize the information that we have been able to produce and to elaborate in a way that can be used in the right way. And this is really a, a challenge and is something that needs to be taken into account in making all this information available. And uh, we will probably need to work together to identify the right level of information and the correct vocabulary and what uh, should be the constraints that should be linked with all this knowledge that will be made available. Because it's amazing having the opportunity to make available to everyone all the knowledge that we can develop. But on the other side, we need to be sure that it is received in the correct way and it is used in the correct way. Otherwise, we'll produce exactly the opposite results that we are expecting. So it's a very, I think, delicate aspect that uh, encompass communication, politics, uh, science. Uh, I think it's really a big, big challenge for, that is not only a technological challenge, because the, from a certain point of view, it, must, it is relatively easy technically to make this information available. I think it's much more difficult to regulate the access to this information. And with regulate, I don't mean putting boundaries, but understanding how the information can uh, be delivered to the different uh, uh, category of users. It's, uh, it's, it's a big challenge. Yeah, definitely. Um, yes, so what are your thoughts uh, coming from a biodiversity perspective? I think a lot of the things that Marina said also apply to the biodiversity field. So very much agree with what was being said over there, but uh, I could add a little bit from, let's say, technical perspective. So as part of the uh, DT design as well, we have to, of course, take into account the different user groups that we have. So we imagine maybe there could be different levels of access as well. So if we think about, uh, for example, policymakers or other applied target audiences, we need to, to, of course, ensure that we have systems in place that make the information uh, accessible to them. And then we could also have more developer oriented access. So uh, people who are actually the, the modelers can have uh, also access in, in a different way. Uh, th Thomas, uh, to um, um, make a step towards you, um, a destination Earth is uh, has a, let's say, a, a long horizon to uh, uh, create all kinds of twins. Um, where do you think this will lead in the future? How long will this destination of um, digital Earth twins uh, go on for? Yeah, I guess that's a question that you can answer on, on several levels. So I think very much coming back to the previous question, so very much we want Destination Earth to be uh, uh, a user-driven and community-driven uh, uh, exercise. So we established a uh, uh, user exchange meetings that we do every six months. The last one we had, we had uh, 400 uh, attendant, attendees. Uh, a lot of communities were there and they're quite, quite vocal on what they want and what they expect from Destination Earth. And we take that, uh, that into consideration and, and make that part of the design of Destination Earth. I think that is the only way that you can make uh, an initiative like Destination Earth uh, sustainable. On the other hand, we also have a st strategic advisory board where uh, the humanities and the social sciences are very well presented and very vocal <laughs> on uh, how they uh, would like to see the development of Destination Earth and how they want to have the governance organized such that indeed you can incorporate the demands and the wishes from your different uh, stakeholder communities and they actually drive the design of Destination Earth. Um, so obviously uh, Destination Earth at this current stage, um, we are implementing the first sort of pre-production pre prototype kind of thing uh, that will already be able to, to deliver something. And then in, in, the, in, the, in the subsequent phase, we'll, we will move towards this operational model where this is, a, an, is an established service uh, that is driven by by the community and and as, as such make it sustainable 
Um, maybe some of my own thoughts on making this sustainable, uh, what I see in the various projects. Um, so on one side, the EU is setting, let's say, um, enabling projects to create new twins. And on the other side, I see twins um, projects being made, but not for the purpose of having a project, but by uh, driving, for example, scientists to create better models. And that means that at the end of the project, uh, the model isn't gone. There, there is a better reusable model for everyone because these models will become publicly available in the infrastructure. And I saw some questions on how do we then find these models? And that's exactly why we have links to EOSC, um, where, for example, um, um, data sets and models can be um, uh, listed, but also accessed uh, in a way um, uh, that makes them findable and understandable and reusable. And I think for BioDT also, um, the research infrastructures that are going to host and run and um, use these twins for their end users, which are scientists, um, the end goal is for them to adopt this technology. So the twins will not be lost in some way. They will be part of the infrastructure that is available for all of Europe. So I think that's the kind of mindset that we need to have. Um, uh, just a highlight uh, from um, Francisco, um, uh, that there is also some cross-pollination happening between these twins, where, for example, the BioDT and Edito twin are somehow merging to do uh, biodiversity for marine life in the Project Bioflow, which is going to start halfway through this year. Um, some other questions I saw in the chat. Um, Let's see, what are the biggest challenges um, for creating these twins or having the right facilities? Um, maybe Jenny, you can say something about this. Uh, I guess there are quite many challenges or you can think about them like at different, different levels. I can, I, I can mention some related to the climate, climate digital twin and then others can uh, continue and add after me. So, uh, in the climate digital win, uh, one challenge is that we want to do these very high resolution climate simulations because th then we can really get this local information on the climate change impacts. And this local information is that is relevant for like uh, normal, more normal people and the users of the uh, climate information. And to do these very high resolution climate simulations, you, uh, you need a lot of computing power uh, and you also, really need to adapt these uh, climate models to to work at these like very new supercomputers. So this is actually a big part of the work that we do during this first phase of the climate digital twin project is that we adapt these existing climate models to work efficiently on the newest super and like fastest supercomputers in Europe. Also the big challenge with this uh, high resolution climate simulations is that you get also huge amount, amounts of data and then you need to have like capabilities to handle handle this data. Uh, more generally in the climate digital twin, the whole, uh, when you are developing this kind of new workflow where you, for the first time, you integrate these climate models with uh, impact models that can then tell about really about these impacts of climate change. Uh, that is, of course, uh, challenge, challenging always when you are developing something new. Maybe others can add from their point of view more, of the, more on the challenges. I can offer some on the BioDT side. Uh, so I think when it comes to biodiversity data, then um, one of the challenges of let's say main challenges that we are dealing with something that's very new which is why the project is intended as a as a prototype or to establish prototype dts but um if we think about biodiversity data in particular then availability uh the quality uh level of standardization of data are, are really quite important considerations because we have data coming from usually many different types of sources so this can 
lead to, to challenges in establishing a single digital twin. Of course, it will be faced when we are connecting, if we aim to connect many digital twins. So that's one thing. And then we also have uh, this, um, of course, task of adapting our particular tools for high performance computing. Mm, I think just a general challenge that applies to all the different DTs, of course, and on the policy side is that uh, climate change is, of course, happening very fast, which places time constraints on, on the work that we are doing. So it's basically a crucial decade to, to take action. And uh, so it's not just about work on the DT development side, but on other fronts as well. So what I'm hearing both Yeni and Yessa say is also that uh, that relates to another question is how how um, difficult is it for all these twins to you know work together or collaborate and uh, I think that's uh, something that we see in the current landscape of uh, science or models is that they all use different data sets they all use different scopes they all use different scales they all use different programming languages and which is of course fine uh, but it makes it makes it very difficult for them to you know become integrated in some way um, and also it makes it difficult to run on let's say high performance computing infrastructure because that works in a completely different way uh, let's say if you have a model for a specific region that works but now if you, if you want to run that same model on a global scale for the whole world that's a whole different ballgame. Um, uh, another question I see, uh, maybe a quick reaction from all the panelists in terms of there is so much information coming from all of these twins. There's uh, a lot of uncertainty in all of these twins. How do we prevent either the information overload or the uh, un prevent the end user from burdening them with too much uncertainty? So maybe a quick reaction from all the panelists on these uh, two topics. Yes, I can start. So I think that this is a little bit a paradigm of <laughs> our uh, era because it's, we are overloaded with information. And uh, this is, of course, is a risk with this uh, digital twin. But uh, uh, what uh, we are also trying to build uh, is that uh, we will have uh, API for accessing the information. We will have a catalog uh, infrastructures, and this should be able, if structured uh, properly, to guide the users to grab the information that they need without uh, uh, grabbing information they do not need uh, or uh, preventing them to get uh, lost and overflowed with a set of information that are not relevant for what they need to do. And this is really the challenge of our society now where the information is so easily available that we need to have tools to understand what is needed and what is not. And hopefully what we are going to develop in terms of the digital twin infrastructure will sort out this problem for the users, providing them an extremely uh, powerful search engine that will uh, able to satisfy the request, addressing exactly what they need and not uh, uh, just opening a door <laughs> to thousands of uh, information that are not what they are looking for. All right, Yeni? Yes, so maybe I, I can comment on the uncertainty uh, part. So this is actually a very important point because if we want uh, policymakers to really base their decisions on our digital twins, there really needs to be a trust on the output and results of the digital twins. So uh, that's why actually it's really important part of also, for example, our work in the climate digital twin to validate uh, the modeling results using earth observations and to really quantify the uncertainties of these impact assess assessments because uh, uh, yeah these this information is really needed to be able to make decisions based on this climate digital twin or other digital twin results yes sir. so evaluating the uncertainty of the models and so forth this also a uh, specific task in BioDT. So uh, later on this year, we have a uh, work that is going to start on this as well. 
And the idea is that we will use combination of, of uh, AI methods, but then also, of course, expert knowledge. So we can't uh, simply rely on, on models, but we also need to have this uh, sanity check in place to, to make sure otherwise. Okay, and Thomas? Yeah, so similar answer, I guess. So as part of the digital twin engine, we will also make uh, uh, tools available, interfaces available that will assist in this uh, uh, quality assessment. And obviously, um, it's also some of the, I mean, this, there's also some responsibility of on the, um, Basically, at some point for for destination Earth, we, we expect that there will be services exposed on the on the on the central platform, the service platform, the ESA platform, where users will interact with these models. Um, we don't expect that we will expose raw data at that level for people just just to fish through and just extract whatever they want, right? So the these services will be designed with a sp specific purpose in mind and presenting the. Uh, the, the uncertainty qualification and the quality aspects of what, what you're presenting there uh, is, is part of, the, of that service and it's the responsibility of, the, of, of who is um, uh, publishing that service. Right, I think given the time, a last uh, question, um, maybe for Jesse and Marina, um, what do you think is the next step after these um, first prototype digital twins and how can we achieve let's say how can we increase um the impacts on biodiversity maybe yes at first and then marina yes so the goal is very much in the long term to to move from prototypes to something that is, is tested and, and verified there's also of course a long long way to get there um, what I would also imagine could happen in the longer run is that we will have more uh, combination of, let's say, biologically and physically oriented Earth, Earth system twins. Um, and how to in increase the impact of this, so how to actually approach, um, let's say, decision makers and so on, we need to involve them, of course, in also testing the prototypes and getting feedback on our uh, on them. So uh, I can comment from BioDT side. So we have, uh, for example, industry engagement, and there could also be, of course, ways to gain feedback from scientists and policymakers and so forth. But it's, it is a long way to, to make this something that uh, can be implemented fully in decision making, let's say. All right, Marina? Yes, I think that uh, it's really challenging, but uh, I hope that um, being able to make uh, information and tools and services avail easy, available and accessible via Digital Twin will be able not only to provide this information to a community that is not uh, the, let's say, typical uh, community of scientists, but will enable also to put the different communities of scientists more closely in contact and enabling them to use the knowledge that is coming from a very different uh, sector. And this is something that is really a challenge. If you look at uh, the ocean, so there are all the aspects that uh, can go from biodiversity to uh, the physical currents. And the communities that are dealing with these different uh, aspects of the same ecosystem are uh, using a very different language, different tools, are coming from very different, um, uh, a very different background. It's not that easy to communicate and uh, to work together for building knowledge. And I hope that this is something that the digital twin on the long term will enable. And that is amazing what uh, we will be able to do once we will be able to understand each other and uh, to build on the work of uh, uh, scientists working in a different uh, uh, sector of where we are used to work. All right, it, it makes me think back on the gaming engine. I'm, uh, I li really like the example. Um, if we can capture reality 
in a you know sufficient way with the good bright quality in a digital environment that means we're freely able to experiment and do anything in this digital world and what we see in gaming in in gaming industry a lot is that once um, this understanding is there, for example, a physics engine or, you know, how things collide, how you can make characters move, et cetera, et cetera. This then becomes a basic building block freely available for anyone. I think that's the true challenge that we are facing or that we're trying to tackle in making this scientific understanding freely available for anyone on the globe. I think that's a great way to maybe close off this panel discussion. Um, Rita, back to you. Thank you, Yaron, and th thank you again to all our panelists. Um, we have uh, arrived at the end of our uh, webinar, and we really hope that you have learned something more about the, um, the digital uh, her twins in general. Uh, th this was uh, one of the first webinars that we have organized with Destination Earth, but we are still planning to uh, organize other events. So uh, stay tuned, vi visit our website because uh, more information about also the cooperation that we are establishing with all these initiatives will be published soon online. Um, I would like to take also this opportunity to let you know that in June, we are also going to organize another webinar. Uh, of VALUEDT. Uh, it will be more related to, uh, let's say, the uh, technical side. Uh, so if you are interested also to explore a little bit in more details these aspects, we really uh, invite you to um, visit our website and then join our next event. And uh, I thank again all our speakers, all our panelists and all the attendees for joining today. Uh, the, um, well, the, the recording of this webinar and the slides will also be available online, so you can also uh, record it later on. Thank you again, everyone. Bye-bye.